This call is now being recorded. Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and I'm with Audrey Waters. It's the 5th of October. We're hoping that you get a better audio quality this time around. Right, Audrey? <laughs> yes. We seem to be working through various software, hardware, network difficulties, but so far so good this week. Can you believe that it's still not brain dead simple to record something? What's I think that it's it's so it's I think it's a, a really interesting indication of um, the the control that the the telephone companies and the network companies have still over the, these these sort of bold new methods of communication that we have. You know, your problem last week was Verizon. Um, and it's, I mean, it's really interesting that even with the ability to have voice over IP, and that's what we're using right now to record this, that there, there's still actually that, um, that obstacle to, you know, to our, to our conversations. The flip side of it is that we do have so many options. Right, and we've tried them all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, you, your first story was kind of back to the now monthly new and noteworthy education apps. Um, yes. Starting with Dandelion. Yeah, it's you know it's funny. It, it's actually getting harder and harder for me to find the apps that I really adore. That sounds so. I mean, that sounds really awful for me to say, but like I really want to showcase ones that are that I that I think are sort of ex exceptional. Um, and so I've gone from, I think initially when I started this series, I would find 10 and then I went to five and, um, I, I picked three and one of them's not even really an, an app. Um, but I like Dandelion a lot. It's a, it's the result of a Kickstarter project from earlier this year. It's a, um, it's an iPad app, a, 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 an interactive story and it's a, it's a, it's a, a sweet story. And I think that they're, they've done some very clever things with the way in which you can um, interact with the content. So it's a, it's a story about uh, being bullied at school. So it, it got it got my my uh, it got my thumbs up. Also, getting a thumbs up from you was Bad Piggies, um, I know. which is available. I will, I... Go ahead. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, and it's available across platform, and I think I featured another Rovio app. Um, this is, comes, of course, from the makers of Angry Birds, and I really, I really, I can't help but like um, these guys, this company. I think that that what they've built is is got some um, um, has some really clever ways of thinking about um, about physics. Um, the games are pretty fun, um, and I I I happen to find myself. Um, playing the Angry Birds and playing this new version uh, quite a bit. I actually really liked Amazing Alex. Mm -hmm. I did too. The the uh, it was intriguing for me to go through that experience of it was a free download. The, the reason I didn't buy it was uh, in fact probably more interesting to me than the actual game. Um, you know what? It, I don't know how much it is a dollar ninety nine or something. Just you know, yeah, something okay. of a pittance. But I didn't buy it because I couldn't actually play it for long enough and get challenged enough to get hooked into it. And by yeah. not giving me enough free, I kind of just could easily leave it. Yeah, no, I mean, and I think that this is, this is a, you know, a really interesting thing about game development, probably mobile game development right now, is that a lot of these games definitely aren't designed for immersion they aren't designed for long gameplay they really do seem to be the sort of thing that you play for a minute or two minutes at a time so there's not a lot of depth there's not certainly not um you know character development or some of the things that you associate with other sorts of video games um and i think that there's uh i mean i think that the I don't know if the genius of the Angry Birds is that there's that branding component that are going to make the Big Piggies game a lot more popular because it's a character that people already a character. I mean, it's a green a green pig, but it's a character people already are familiar with. Tell us about learnable programming. Well, I had mentioned I had mentioned this. Um, I guess it was last week or the week before. This is. This is Brett Victor's um, really incredible essay response to Khan Academy's computer science um, 
computer science curriculum. And I think that there, I mean, it's, there, there's a lot here that, that Brett is talking about in terms of rethinking how we, um, rethinking how we teach programming, rethinking how we develop programming languages. And I think that it's, um, it's also hearkening back to some of the, some of the earlier development, developments in computer science from folks who had a very, who I think had a, a strong sense of computing and education going hand in hand. So um, languages like Logo, um, like Smalltalk, so, you know, Seymour Paper, um, Alan Kay, people who've been, you know, don't think about how to teach people to code, but really think of computational thinking and helping kids learn to, to think programmatically. Um, it's a different way, I think, of, um, it's a different way of thinking about what programming is about other than just here's some skills that you will take you through a rote process that you can master. Um, and so I think that um, I definitely recommend um, folks spending some time really working through and thinking through, looking through the examples that um, Brett Victor has given. Does this relate at all to the conversations you and I have had about the difference between process and outcome? That the focus on process? Yeah, I mean, I think it absolutely does. And this is, you know, I mean, and I think that that's, uh, you know, of course, Brett Victor had this wonderful talk, I guess it was earlier this year, called Inventing on Principle. And he sort of showcased uh, the notion that he conceived of having a dual windows where people could sort of, you could play with the code and immediately see the results. And, but interestingly, many people have interpreted that live coding exercise as the product and not thinking about the, the process of exploration and play. And I think it's um, of, of thinking about education. Do you want to focus on the thing? And of course, if you're thinking about a, a, prod, a product that you can sell or, or you know, deliver via your website versus do you want to think about the process of learning and ex exploration? I mean, and I, I mean that in, a, in the sense of code and of any other, you know, any other uh, process. You and I are both reading Deschooling Society uh, right now by Ivan Illich, and it feels like this is such a direct tie to this idea that he proposes in the first page where there's a problem with institutionalizing values. He, these are my words, not his, but rather than institutionalizing the process, and it feels like that's just such mm -hmm. a significantly insightful way to look at how we're thinking about education right now. It's, it's um, you know, it, I loved it this week. There was a, and I, I talk about it in my news roundup, but there was a study released by the National Science, or it was funded by the National Science Foundation, that discovered um, something that I think, you know, many, many um, educators have known, which is that toddlers and young children actually um, behave like scientists as they learn about their world. So they learn about their world through play, through exploration, through, you know, I mean, but through sort of statistical analysis, through trial and error, through experimentation. And that's how they sort of discover and build the, you know, build their knowledge. Doesn't this sound familiar? And then this, that's actually far more effective. Um, that, that sort of scientific inquiry of toddlers is far more effective than direct scientific instruction. And I think, you know, it's sort of the things that we, that, that um, I think many educators have known already, that we seem to, we, I, we talked about this before too, we seem to sort of forget our history, forget what we've, um, what we've done in the past, what we've talked about in the past, the theorists like Illich. Now that book is from 1970, is that right? Yeah, in the early '73 yeah. or something. Yeah, and so, in it, but yet, it, I mean, it feels it. It doesn't feel. Um, it doesn't. I mean, of course, and he mentions you know webs of learning, but it doesn't feel um, outmoded. In fact, it feels incredibly relevant. 1971. Yeah, the other day, I think I told you I discovered a book on self-directed learning from the '70s. Mm -hmm. I have this idea, this feeling that we're going to go back and discover that there's a treasure trove of material in the 70s that was very relevant to the kind of um, discussions that we're having now that that maybe were more widely 
read John Holt, for instance? Right. I think I've I think I've heard rumors of maybe Bud Hunt and Gary Steger talking about doing a MOOC or a P2PU class where we or a book group. Let's call it a book group. We don't have to brand it with the hype of the day, but a book group where we go back and read together some of these classics. Um, so you know, education you know sort of educational theorists and practitioners that are 30 years old at least, um, because I do think I think you're right. I think that there's a lot that we um, a lot that we need to rediscover. I'm also wondering if there was a period of time when, and again, I mean, if we look at the last 30 years as reflecting kind of a shift in our culture and society, you know, the, the move away from the 60s kind of questioning culture toward the, toward the sort of the beginning of the economic bubble, and that if there is, that part of this isn't just, uh, at least in the United States, going to be reflective of changes in sort of culturally how we've looked at education. No, I think, I mean, I think that you can, I mean, again, you know, coming back to the focus on the outcomes, focus on assessment, um, focus on um, standardization, um, all of the things that, all of the sort of um, policies and practices that we've seen um, become uh, sort of more and more entrenched run counter, I think, to a lot of, I mean, and those were in some ways, um, in opposition to a to a more open ended and exploratory way of thinking about learning. Okay, so tell me why you're not really excited about a consumer reports for EdTech. <laughs> well, uh, so this this was um, this was a report that came that was uh, written by a couple of economists sponsored by the Brookings Institute who argued that. Um, that the problem with education technology is that we don't have a consumer report sort of version in which you can um, sort of, so teachers and parents and schools don't have a go-to guide, an independent go-to guide where they can sort of look at all of the features in various pieces of education software and then make a smart decision um, based on how well those influence uh, test scores. <laughs> Um, and so I think that there's there's so many problems. I mean, there, to me, there are so many problems with with this idea. Um, least of which being is the fact that they that they're basing it on the Common Core state standards. And so this is going to this is again something focused on assessment and outcome, which um, which I'm not sure is sort of the I'm not sure that that's the right metric at all for why we adopt technology. Um, any technology in our lives, but it to me doesn't seem like moving the needle on the on on the standardized test isn't shouldn't be the our sort of first go to motivation. But that's reflective of sort of the larger problem, at least for for think talking about education and learning, right? That mm-hmm. that a measurement uh, for the kinds of things that you and I end up talking about a lot. Uh, engagement, self-directed learning, kind of a devoted interest and in discipline in the topic, but those are really hard to measure, mm-hmm. so that you end up measuring things that aren't as meaningful, but they're easier to measure. Well, and I think that um, supposedly they're easier than. I mean, the notion I think with with standardization of the curriculum in the way in which the Common Core visualizes it too is that is that you can then sort of replicate those results everywhere. So this idea would be that if if a classroom in Iowa tests an app and the students and it shows, you know, that the students do better on um, you know, a certain literacy element, that then that app can be adopted by schools all over the country and they too will have the same results. Um and I just don't <laughs> I don't think that um, I don't think that classrooms work that way. I don't think that kids' brains work that way. I don't think that the, that the tool itself is necessarily the dial that you can fiddle with in order to sort of make make the difference. So to be clear, this is just a um, an idea that's now looking for sponsorship, right? Right, but I think you know. I think that. I mean, I think that. The you know the Common Core um, the Common Core is certainly go- um, is certainly going to be big big business 
for the education industry, particularly as it sort of tied into some of the policy and funding measures that the um, administration um, is demanding for, for race to the top. Um, and so I think we'll see new textbooks that are Common Core aligned, new assessments that are Common Core aligned, education software that's Common Core aligned. And so to me, it felt as though this is another move by folks who want to sort of get a piece of that action. Um, and I couldn't help but, you know, push back on the notion that anything funded by the Department of Ed and the Gates Foundation does not count as an independent organization, um, you know, you know, writing or talking or researching ed tech. So your next post is highly personal. Yeah. Right? And, the, and the story has, in fact, changed a little from when you posted it, I think. It has changed. Right. Although I would say that, you know, the piece that I posted on my blog certainly still stands. So on um, my son, who, who have chronicled before, my 19-year-old son, um, has opted not to go to college. He's struggled to find work as, I think, um, as, you know, becoming increasingly the narrative if you don't have a college degree, if you don't, um, it's, it's very hard to find a job in, in the current economy. Um, and so he decided that he was going to enlist in the Army, something that I was pretty um, conflicted about as much as I've told him. <laughs> and I would support his decisions for what he decides to do with his life. It was a hard, it was a hard decision for me to take. Um, and on Tuesday, he went to Salt Lake for the sort of enlistment process. Um, and interestingly enough, his mental health background, um, he saw a therapist when he was 12, when his dad was dying of cancer. Um, having a mental health record um, made him ineligible to join the military. So the Army actually rejected him, uh, he found out yesterday. There are so many elements of the story that are both really touching and hard to describe. Um, I want to ask a, a question that that may be hard, but I'm curious as to the reality of the answer. So how much do you think being 19 years old and facing uh, sort of low job prospects is a consequence of a diminished economy, is a consequence of not having a credential, or is a consequence of a mindset that makes it very hard to think about being proactive and creative? You know, it's really interesting, and this is sort of um, sort of answering it in a long way, but Alfie Cohn had a wonderful piece in the Huffington Post this week in which he talked about sort of this new, sort of one of the new hot things that I, I hear a lot of folks in both business and education talk about is that we need to sort of, um, we need to sort of help kids embrace failure. And um, that if kids, the kids, we just need to sort of help kids learn more um, and learn more from their failures. And and I think that, you know, his his argument was that, you know, failure is really, um, kids experience failure all the time, and it's actually not a positive learning experience for them. And I would say that there's a lot of that. I think that a lot of this um, with with my son is that there's all of this sort of cultural, these sort of cultural expectations that what you do when you finish school are or high school is that you go on to college. What you do is you get a job. I think that that's you know culturally. For a young man, that's a very important piece of the identity as well. And so, you know, Isaiah was feeling very much like a failure. And I think that this, um, this isn't, this is really sort of isn't like a positive learning thing that, you know, I think he really wants to sort of embrace. I think it's very hard to, um, I think it's sort of very hard to think your way out and sort of, um, move your way out psychologically from being in a position where you've made choices that the rest of society sees as bad ones um, and the ways in which you're marked as a failure, even though, I mean, I don't, I don't believe that for a second, um, but, you know, I think that society cer certainly does and he feels that label thrust, thrust upon him. And I think it is a hard, a hard thing to get out of. 
And I actually feel as though the decision to join the military is sort of, is often framed as a sort of um, last resort option. And so uh, it's really hard for me, you know, we don't, we live in separate states now. It's very hard for me to sort of feel very, really bad for him because I feel like the last resort um, didn't, it didn't pan out. So knowing that I don't know Isaiah, knowing that you know we're not talking about him specifically, let's just say we're talking about 19-year-old boys who have, mm-hmm. feel like they have limited prospects. I'm really curious about the the difference between those prospects are limited by virtue of not having the degree, or mm-hmm. they're limited by virtue of having gone through a school system which largely gives them this message of passive compliance and obedience. Now, I'm going to say this carefully, right? But, okay, if you go out to a business and you say, I will work for you for free for two weeks. You know, if you like me, keep me on. If not, I will have learned something of value. I'll have been sort of proactive in my life, and I'll know whether or not I like a particular career. I know that works. Mm Mm-hmm. But when you when you suggest that to a 19 year old, it's so foreign to them, and I'm thinking it's foreign to them because they have no sense of actually being in charge. No, I think that that's precisely right. I mean, and I think that that's actually you know to sort of think about. I mean, you know, to bring it back to me, I think about my own parenting decisions. Is that I very much believe in you know we talk about this all the time. I believe in agency. I think that people need to sort of forge their own path, make their own decisions. That they shouldn't. They shouldn't just rely on the culturally accepted or the institutionally sanctioned path towards their future. But that's all well and good. I'm um, I'm not sure that um, whether it's sort of my upbringing or the school system or our society at large. I don't know if Isaiah is actually or any again any 19 year old male is actually necessarily equipped to do so. Um, I saw Dale Stevens from Oncology the other night and. I said to him that I think that this is actually the message that he needs to be thinking about isn't and sort of drop out of school and follow your dreams. It's actually how do we really equip kids, um, kids, uh, young adults to to do that? Because I I think some folks are have a propensity to sort of forge ahead, um, seize their future. But I'm not sure that we're culturally raising our children to to be to be as independent as we say we'd like them to be. Again, with due apologies to Isaiah if he listens to this. <laughs> We're not talking <laughs> I don't, I don't know you. I'm just <laughs> thinking out loud about this as a topic. And I'm intrigued because um it's hard for me not to draw some pretty quick lines to a system which basically says follow and we'll guide you through to a promised end goal yes then in most cases doesn't do that and also doesn't recognize that you know maybe it does recognize that it's creating a sense of dependency on somebody else's decision making right for you to be able to go out and accomplish things of worth and value right okay so sorry Isaiah (laughs) (laughs) so tell me about ginkgo tree I just don't know that much about this topic as a whole you know this is this is a, a company that i really like for a number of reasons um i i love it that they're bootstrapped um they're not silicon valley based um they've um sort of been working on web development in general and sort of um been thinking about solving this problem and you know having having taught a lot of college classes and but, you know, I, I never used a textbook. But what I would do would be pull together various materials into a course packet um, for students. And that means dealing with copyright clearance. That often meant, you know, spending hours photocopying sections and chapters from books, um, piecing it together, sort of leaving a, leaving a paper copy in the library, um, having the, you know, university run digital copies, the library um, you know, posting things as PDFs. It's really a time consuming process and one that, um, you know, one that I think it, it doesn't work, uh, doesn't work for professors and I don't think it works that well for students 
either. Um, interestingly, I think a lot of the folks that are talking about textbook and digital material solutions are thinking about solving the problem on the student end and not looking at solving it on the teacher end. And so I really thought that this was a great idea, super easy, great looking website to use. Um, you list the, you, they handle the, the copyright improvement through the, um, through an API. They'll print you labels that you can ship your books that can be scanned and OCR'd. And it's a flat fee for students, um, uh, flat monthly fee for students. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a little, perhaps a little problem in, in the world of higher ed, but I think this is a rather elegant solution. So this would appear to be a case where the pain test actually is pretty appropriate. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Okay, so tell me about scare quotes around the word research in your story on USV. Oh man, this is um this is the post I wrote yesterday that it's still getting comments. Um I think the comments flooding in. Um so Union Square Ventures is a very well known, very well respected um technology venture uh firm based based in New York City. Um their portfolio includes Tumblr, Twitter, Etsy, Kickstarter. Um and they have a couple of education companies that they funded as well. Um, Edmodo, perhaps being the one that maybe most of our listeners will have heard of. Um, and so they've just, they made, and I think it's a commendable move, they've said they've made an effort to be more open with their research. Um, and interestingly enough, the first set of research that they published was on, was on education. Their hypotheses around, um, the future of online education, um, and I guess by extension, what's worthy of investment um, as, a, as a venture capitalist. And then they sort of they shared a Google Doc with a list of that research. And I have research in, in scare quotes because it's actually not research. It's a list of, I think, a dozen um, magazine articles, um, half a dozen TED Talks. There's no research there. It's really... the it, Various opinions in the popular press about, um, you know, disruptive ed- disruptive innovation and education technology. So before we go down that highly appealing rabbit hole, because <laughs> <laughs> this is what you and I live for, right? Um, <laughs> were there conclu- well, tell me about their hypotheses. Uh, was it the, the the research? was behind these hypotheses, but just the hypotheses themselves. What did you think I, of those? I guess the research was behind the hypotheses. I mean, this was this was what's sort of odd to me. And I, I mean, and I say this with sort of a, you know, background as a scholar is that you do, I mean, that is the process of research, right? You, you come up with sort of whatever research questions you're asking, and then you, um, you do a little digging and you sort of start to form hypotheses and arguments um, based Based on the subject matter that that you're looking into, and so the the, hy- the hypotheses that they shared are that um, they don't think that there will be sustainable business models for content. Um, so, in other words, I think content content will be free. Educational content will be free. Um, they they're interested in education platforms that are in a vertical um, as opposed to education in a horizontal. So, so, so for example, rather than K-12, they're interested in um, a particular sort of career-oriented, so computer science education, foreign language learning. Um, and then finally, they think that it's really about um, it's really about credentialing. And uh, if there's if there isn't a credential or some sort of job, then um, that it's not interesting to them. Aspirational. That's aspirational is the way they describe it. I don't even know where to start. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, it's so it's so interesting, right? I, I guess where I would start is that uh, I left this post, even in the dialogue, even with Fred Wilson that, that takes place in the yeah. comments, I left it feeling like this is operating at such a surface level. There, that each of those points whether or not they're even being followed in their own investments, deserves right. an incredibly detailed conversation. 
as, but it's, I mean, Fred didn't even bother to capitalize appropriately on his post to you. And I thought, <laughs> is this just, is everything just happening at this totally surface level? Well, and that's sort of the response the, from the person who wrote it was that this is, you know, this is the 50,000 foot view that we wanted to give to our venture partners so that they would have a sense of the lay of the land. This isn't, you know, this isn't a dissertation is sort of the way that you sort of the, the snarky response. This isn't a dissertation or a literature review. This is just a, you know, this is just a quick overview. But it's actually like a damn lousy one at that. Um, it's, it's not even a good, you know, pointing to, you know, a couple of stories in the Atlantic and the New York Times does not an overview of, of education technology make. Um, and so, it really does feel like there's a very superficial, there's a very superficial amount of, quote, research um, going on by investors. And, you know, you can look at the sorts of things that get that get funded and you can perhaps nod your head and say, yep, they aren't doing research. Um, but it, it does feel as though the conversations that they're having to sort of prep them to make these decisions about who to fund um, feel very superficial. Uh, I mean, and I think actually superficial is a nice way to put it. I would say it's sort of dangerously uninformed when you think about the hundreds of millions of dollars that they're actually um, that they're actually using here. It feels like a virtual cocktail party with people sort of boasting and and large money getting shipped around. And I, I had a very hard time even wanting to go to the serious conversation because it felt like there was so much that that uh, couldn't be said in the soundbite seconds that are, that are going to take place here. I think, I mean, it, you know, the, the, I think about this all the time in sort of the work that I do, and I and I saw someone in the comments, I think, called me um, churlish. Um, someone recently said, you know, I was just the contrarian. Um, that, and I think that, um, I think that there's, I don't think that people necessarily want to go there. I mean, I, I don't think that the investors necessarily want to ha have deep and meaningful and thoughtful conversations. Um, I, and I'm not sure that a lot of entrepreneurs want to have those conversations. Um, I think that the, that the surface level is that these are, you know, these are not the things that will get at the roots to hack education, if you will. And again, it's, it's easy to, to come back to our discussion about pain versus value and symptoms versus causes, mm -hmm. right? And the sort of the, the true deep issues in education. Um, and, and, and I saw a connection here between sort of my experience at South by Southwest EDU last year. And you probably have to be a little bit careful since you've accepted, mm -hmm. you know, being on the, the selection board, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But it felt to me like they'd hired a young sort of, inexperienced, doesn't know much about education guy to kind of run this, and that there was almost a premium on lack of experience, because <laughs> if you were to go to the depth, then you'd actually have to struggle with some pretty real questions, like, is it appropriate for Dell to be teaching teachers about the classroom? Well, but I think that this is something that, I mean, this is something that I I see all the time. And in fact, there there is a premium on being an outsider. And I I hear a lot of education entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley sort of make the comments that anyone who works in education is sort of so enamored with the way in which the institutions um, operate that they can't possibly be innovative. So you actually have to have someone come in who has no experience, who has no sort of stake in the current models in order to do things differently, um, which I think really grossly overlooks the work of many people who work inside the system, who do innovative things on a daily basis, and but who are also committed to making substantive change. Um, it's not as though every K-12 through classroom teacher is a sort of um, you know, stands at the front of the class and reads aloud from the textbook and makes their students write you know, write down those passages on a slate for crying out loud. I mean, that's, you know, there's, there are, there's a lot of innovation and I think that, um, expertise, um, and deep thinking are really important, uh, but it's not, I don't think it's valued. 
One of the criticisms often leveled at Blackboard is that it's a financial company, not an education company. Do you think mm -hmm. that Fred, uh, that, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say Fred, that Union Square Ventures is kind of showing us that these are financial companies more than they are education companies? Well, I, I mean, I can't help it. I can't help but think that. I mean, and, that, and that's, they are, you know, they are venture capitalists, right? They are taking other people's money and investing it in startups that they believe are going to give them the best return for their dollar. I mean, this is absolutely a financial decision that's being made. I think that you can, there are some investors that I think make their investments in a more, um, paying attention to, um, you know, sort of more social reasons, so sort of social investing as opposed to um, sort of the eye on the bottom line. I don't think that that's Union Square Ventures. Um, uh, um, so, so I, you know, and I look at the rest of their portfolio outside their education companies. You know, I think of what Twitter is, Twitter is experiencing right now, um, you know, in part, in no small part, because it's taken so much venture capital investment. That it's having to, um, it's having to make money in ways that many of its users are beginning to find pretty icky. Um, and so I think that, I mean, this is partially why I, I really wish there were ways to get educators to pay more attention. You know, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Like, how can we get educators to make, pay more attention to these things? Because the investors actually do have some say in the co direction that companies take. So what does it mean that this is, that Union Square Ventures owns a stake of Edmodo? So I'm trying to figure out how to reconcile this with the fact that you still struggle to find sponsors or those who will pay you for the work that you're doing when you're operating kind of at the deeper level rather than the surface level. I mean, why isn't Fred Wilson hiring you? <laughs> That's funny. Someone actually tweeted that. That was, the, I think, the first thing that drew my attention to this report in the first place. Although I should say, I do, I do read Fred's blog, but um, that, that someone tweeted, like, you know, I wish that um, VCs would um, hire Audrey to do real um, education research. Um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's that I'm, I would point to the. I don't know if I could uncover the sorts of things that they necessarily want uncovered. Um, I'm not sure I've got an eye to the next, you know, the next Google, the next Facebook for education that's going to IPO and bring them millions and millions and millions of dollars um, in, in profit. Okay, we'll leave that one there. <laughs> okay, so to the news roundup. Um, Yes. So, again, uh, we, we got to hear from both candidates for the presidency of the United States on education. Um, you and I Did both you watch didn't the debate? watch the oh. actual debate. <laughs> yeah. no, I was in the middle of the library 2.012 conference, which suffered in attendance that night because of the debate. But, mm -hmm. um, I, I, again, uh, do we really want candidates speaking at the surface level about education? Wouldn't you? Ra I would much rather hear somebody say, "You know, these are really deep and hard conversations that aren't going to get solved in a soundbite." <laughs> I think that 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 is. I mean, I think that that's how I feel about sort of politics in general, is particularly politics on um, in that sort of debate format, where it's actually lobbing soundbites back and forth at each other and grinning wittily at the camera. I mean, it doesn't like a debate isn't that those style of debates are actually who can come up with the best zingers, the most memorable one-liners. Um, and it's not actually having a substantive or um, intellectual or honest uh, conversation about any of anything. Except any for big reactions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So, uh, probably best to move on. So Facebook is now going to rescue us from COPPA because of the like button. This is, yeah, so, so the, um, so we are in the process of sort of updating, revising some of the, some of the COPPA rules. And interestingly, but not surprisingly, Facebook wrote a very long letter, um, to the administration, um, arguing that it, that it's 
um, that COPPA goes against free speech in some ways if the company was um, was to be held um, responsible for those under the age of 13 hitting the like button. Um, because, of course, although you have to be 13 to join Facebook, those like buttons are spread all over the web. In fact, it's sort of the sort of in, um, insidious way in which sort of the, the tentacles of Facebook reach everywhere. Um, and so they, you know, they sort of, that they shouldn't ha- they should not have to, um, they should not be beholden to the, the, the like buttons and those sorts of um, social action buttons like that um, shouldn't, shouldn't fall under the, the COPPA regulations. To me, I think it's, it's, you know, it's part of this way in which really these, these laws, particularly these laws around, whether they're around privacy or, you know, protecting, protecting kids at school, web filtering, they feel like they're so antiquated that we actually can't have um, smart conversations about how best to protect students because, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know what the right, and I don't know sort of what the right answer to this, I mean, other than sort of, you know, it sort of irks me that Facebook's selling my data in general, um, being over 13 or not, but it, it's it's hard to, I think it's really hard to extract the laws from the, you know, from what the technology actually looks like today. I was confused by by your representation of it, not because you were confusing, but because I didn't have time to dive deeply. But COPPA essentially says that a commercial company can't store information about mm-hmm. someone under the age of 13, or it has in the past. Without the, so if right, somebody, without their parents' permission. Right. So if somebody's clicking on a like button who's under 13, they're either not a member of Facebook or they're a member of Facebook who've indicated that their age is not what it actually is. So I was mm-hmm. surprised that Facebook would spend time on this because it doesn't seem like this would be the core issue, right? I mean, if they've clicked and they are a member of Facebook, well, Facebook's already in trouble. And if they click and they're not a member of Facebook, does Facebook even know about them? Um, That's a good question. I mean, I, I think that uh, – I do think that the – I don't think that they would have, um, they certainly, I don't know if they would have email address, the sort of email address and identity information. Um, that's a good question. It would have to be that there's some way of capturing um, continued information from a user who turns out to be under 13. Right, right. Right, and so maybe that's their argument. I, I, I shouldn't yeah. speak with meeting, and I'll, I'll actually probably end up looking at it in depth. Um, and okay, I, well, I think so. the, the other problem up that Facebook is concerned about too is that that their like that their like button is also on other websites that could be collecting data. So right, so you've got a like button on uh, I don't know a Justin Bieber. You know, so I mean, I think that Facebook is also concerned that they're going to be liable for the bad for bad behavior of um, other sites who have. Who are who are collecting data through the Facebook mechanism? Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So um, better apps. This is great. Better apps. Um, and um, Daniel promises me that we're going to have a, a a conversation in a couple of weeks once he sort of worked out the early kinks from the new startup. But this is exciting. So. Um, he's a uh, Australian writer, early childhood researcher, um, who has launched a company that's sort of a little bit consulting, a little bit um, uh, sort of web-based um, uh, assessment for to help um, education app developers really think through the features, the functionality, the user experience, the outcomes, the business models. That they're building into their into their products, um, and you know, um, Daniel thought for a long time about how can we really build high quality, um, affordable apps for children. I mean, in the, and so he's not he's actually not assessing, you know, back to the consumer reports. He's not actually assessing sort of like, um, is this app going to help your child learn to speak French in five weeks? Um, it's thinking through the design um, and some of the other features of, of building an app. So it's not on sort of educational outcomes. Um, that's not what he's assessing. 
Interesting. I haven't followed Skype in the Classroom uh, over the last year, but they've added some new partners? They have. Um, they added quite a few new partners, of which NASA was the one that um, certainly caught my attention and I think is pretty exciting. This is, you know, this is Skype's effort to help initially connect classrooms with other classrooms around the world. So um, sort of, sort of, you know, bridging, bridging the geographic divide between, um, b- between classes. And of course, thinking through ways of, of getting, um, sort of getting experts to come virtually visit your class and, um, you know, having an astronaut, having an astronaut visit or an astrophysicist or, um, you know, Mohawk guy on the Mars Curiosity team. Those are all great. So it's good to see NASA sort of making, making some of its um, employees accessible to, to the, to the classrooms that have uh, signed up for this program. I just love this as an idea. Have you talked to anybody who's actually done this in their class? I, I haven't talked to anybody who's, um, who's had that sort of guest speaker, but I do know quite a few people who are, who are using Skype in the classroom to connect classes to talk about perhaps, um, to perhaps projects that they're working on. Um, so it is, it is sort of like, um, an, um, sort of an updated version of, um, of sort of early pen pals. But I think that having kids collaborate, um, uh, it's not just sort of writing back and forth, but you can actually collaborate and work on projects together. Part of what I've loved about this is, is it, it, you can see well below the surface level of, say, um, sort of people who are visible, like Mohawk Guy, to <laughs> graduate students. <and laughs> I wish I can't of, think of what his name is. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, but so you can think that you get to the level of graduate students and all kinds of people who are working in interesting places where a class could actually devote sort of concerted time to understanding a particular issue or something, some work that someone's doing. Yeah. Okay, so the road to free is paved with misinformation. Well, now that sounds like uh, it's a little bit of, but it's easy to understand. It's, it's easy to figure out who might have said that, right? Oh, uh, this. This is this is absolutely precious. So the Association of American Publishers um, released a statement um, that they're 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 um, they're mortified, um, shocked at the misinformation that's being disseminated um, by the Twenty Million Minds Foundation, and that they are opposed to the new laws that were signed into effect by uh, Governor Jerry Brown that would institute. Uh, Free openly licensed textbooks for California's college students. Um, they want to remind you that um, there's no such thing as free, and that the taxpayers are going to have to carry this incredible burden of the five million dollars that have been earmarked for this uh, program. Wah. Which is just so <laughs> sort of blatantly disregards the fact that that five million is significantly less than would have been spent. Right for buying the actual textbooks. I know. I mean, it's it's sort of the road to free is paved with misinformation, and the you know the resp- the response uh, the response from them is sort of um, the, the 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 path to proprietary textbooks also seems to be paved with misinformation. Right. I mean, the, so know, they did the such a good. The, you know, taxpayers Go already ahead. pay for. A lot of things around ta- textbooks. Um, the Twenty Million Minds Foundation pointed out that, you know, that there's a taxpayer-financed Cal grant that is used um, almost exclusively to help um, low-income college students pay for their textbooks, and that's about two hundred million dollars that the state spends on that grant alone. So, um, the, I think that they're that the it's clear that the publishers are sort of doing what they can to discredit. Um, to discredit this move, um, it, uh, to, this move in the state, sort of throw up as many obstacles and, and sort of PR um, red flags as they can. I'm trying to figure out how a hacking group believes that posting personal records for 120,000 uh, students, apparently, right, is yep. a conversation starter for the future of education. <laughs> I don't really get it either. I mean, this this is, um, you know, I think that the um, this this sort of struck me as um, incredible, incredibly silly, and and um, 
you know, I think data data breaches happen pretty frequently in, in you know, in business and in, in education. Um, it doesn't appear as though um, any sort of um, – it doesn't appear as though sort of super secret things were stolen. In some cases, I think the Princeton – the Princeton information were people's um, login – or, excuse me, people's WordPress-related um, user IDs to some uh, – Princeton related blog. So this isn't, this isn't sort of giving away students social security numbers um, and addresses. But even so, I think it does seem a little silly that, that the way to get students thinking about and having conversations about education is to steal their personal data. It doesn't seem like the best laid plan. I was trying to figure out some connection. Is it maybe just the vulnerability of data? I know. I mean, I think that, that maybe that would be it, that sort of, see, we've proven that these are archaic institutions that don't know how to, you know, uh, appropriately sort of protect protect your online identity. I'm not. I'm, I think that's a very generous reading. <laughs> okay, so even though Union Square Ventures doesn't believe there's a future in selling content, um, Pearson certainly seems to be doing quite well selling content, right? But there's a they change sure. there. There's a big change there. So Marjorie Scardino, who's been the CEO, I believe, for the past 16 years, um, announced that she'd be stepping down at the end of the year. Um, and interestingly, um, of course, you know, Pearson, Pearson is, a, is a giant multinational corporation with a lot of different publishing interests as well as its education division. They own Penguin. They own the Financial Times. And it looks as though somewhat similar to what we've seen with News Corp, that they might want to be cutting some of the older or less less profitable um, elements of the company. There's sort of rumors that they want to sell the Financial Times um, to, to another news organization. Interestingly, the new person to take the reins is from the education department to let you know where Pearson's, Pearson's profits come from. They brought in someone with education experience, um, particularly in global education, and that's, I think, where we're going to see Pearson really um, make its moves is to help um, help colonize uh, colonize the rest of the world with standardized tests and textbooks. So that's something so to look forward to. Memo to John Fallon, call Fred Wilson for advice. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Or maybe memo to Fred. Call it. Call John Fallon. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, University of Southern Queensland announced the first OERU course. What does that mean? Yeah, this, this is a this is a very interesting and I think important you know important endeavor. Sort of answering sort of how do we answer this question of learners, independent learners, self paced learners who 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 follow a course, an OER course, reading. You know, reading, um, reading uh, openly uh, licensed materials, completing assignments. How do we grant them credit, or you know, official formal academic credit for the work that they've done with informal OER? Um, and the University of Southern Queensland um, has said that they, you know, they've released a, a class that is going to be offering. So they're making the making the content all openly available online. There actually will be a course. Um, it's free, and they'll be offering credit. I think that there's still details around how the assessment piece works, and so I don't know um, if they'll be charging for the assessment, but I think it's another indication of, th you know, thinking about ways in which we will be able to sort of recognize, um, recognize the learning that people do independently um, and give them college credit for it. Audrey, thanks for another great week of posts. Yeah, thank you. If if you're not on the call next week, I'll know that you're now working for Union Square Ventures. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, if I say I, I, I'll be in, um, I'll, you'll find me, and if you see, I check in on Foursquare and Union Square, you, you know I'm probably up to no damn good. So. <laughs> Have a great week. Thanks.